Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Thank you so much. Greetings in Jesus. Thank you all for joining us. Because we have people whose English is not their mother tongue or main language, I'm going to speak just a little bit slower than usual tonight. I hope I'm going to be slower than usual. Um, I know you all understand English quite well, but some of you obviously have to pay closer attention to, <laughs> than others. Um, but I assure you, your English is better than my Bulgarian. At any event, we're looking at the parousia, the parousia. What is this idea? The revelation of the true sons of God, the parousia. Now, this word for parousia is not the same as the book of Revelation. That's a different word, apocalypsis, meaning unveiling. But the imminence of his return, the imminence of his return, when will that happen? Right now, we see some very unfortunate things happening. We've warned in the past from our teaching on the four sons in Isaiah, a teaching called the four sons in Isaiah, that before Jesus came the first time, there were conspiracy theories running amok. People were running crazy with conspiracy theories before he came the first time about the coming of the Messiah and all kinds of rumors about the Romans, etc., etc. Isaiah warned about this, but it's not just about the first coming of Christ. When we continue reading Isaiah chapter 9, and there's no chapter divisions in the original canon, as you know, it's also speaking of his second coming. To us a child is born, a son is given, okay, the government will be upon his shoulder. Well, he was born the first time, but the second time when he establishes God's kingdom dominion yeah, yeah, yeah. government that's the second coming so isaiah chapters 8 and 9 are speaking both about his first coming and his second and as we pointed out before in isaiah chapter 8 verse 12 you are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all people call a conspiracy you're not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It's the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. One of the things that's happening right now in the present environment is what Isaiah warned about and what we are told not to give heed to. Conspiracy theories are running wild concerning COVID vaccines, particularly at the moment, but also other things. Now, look, I mean, we, we all know, and we've all agreed many times, that the general, general direction in which technology is evolving is very much in line with what Scripture said will happen, going for cashless societies and things of this nature. There's no question that things are evolving this way. But we have irresponsible people saying many irresponsible things. One of them, and again, I, I'm only quoting what he teaches, is, is J.D. Farrick, who's a extreme pre-tribulational advocate to the point where he says that those who are not pre-tribulational are false brothers or of the devil or something like this. And he's basically saying things like, a COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. This is very, very irresponsible. Conspiracy theories are running wild. It is sufficient for Christians to be aware of what's happening in the world in which we find ourselves. But these extra biblical conspiracy theories are not where we should be putting our focus, our energy, our time. It's not where the scriptures tell us to put our focus and energy and time. It is, in short, a diversion. It is a diversion. When we 
begin taking the emphasis off where the word of God tells us to put it and put it on something else. It is a diversion to keep us from doing those things that the Lord wants us to do and calls us to do. There's a lot of diverting going on now. Now, these diversions always involve the hand of the devil. Well-intentioned, sincere Christians get caught up in it. But because they may be sincere or have good intentions, doesn't mean they're not being duped and does not mean that they're not being manipulated by the enemy to dupe other Christians. Right now, the Internet is rife. It's exploding with conspiracy theories related to COVID, COVID vaccine, and things of this nature. That's just one example. If it wasn't COVID, it would be something else. Get ready. The COVID vaccine is here. The Lord is coming. No, that's not what the scripture says. That's not what the scripture says at all. It's going to change our DNA, and it's going to do this. And Scripture doesn't talk about that. That's not where the scripture puts the emphasis. Now, it's perfectly fine, maybe even necessary, for Christians to be aware of what's happening in the realm of technology and how the world of technology is being used to set the stage for end time prophecy. But when that becomes what you're looking at, there's a problem. This is a trick of the enemy to prevent Christians from preparing for and from being ready for the parousia. The parousia. Well, let's understand this further. Not one harvest, but two. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, a well-known passage. Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse. Verse 29, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. Automatically, this refers to two passages of Scripture. One, obviously, is the book of Joel, the book of Joel, chapter 2. There was only a partial fulfillment of Joel, chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, a partial fulfillment. These other things with the sun and moon not giving their light did not happen then. Now, there's a spiritual meaning to these things, of course, as well as a cosmological meaning. And the stars falling, that's Revelation 6. It happens just before the rapture. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 6. What was Jesus talking about? In the sixth seal, verse 12, I saw when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, just like Matthew 24, just like Joel, made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to earth. Revelation 6, Joel 2, Matthew 24 are all speaking of the same thing. Let's continue in Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation, well, we could go on for at least an hour and a half on this issue of the tribulation. But remember, what our pre-tribulational brethren who believe that myth do is they make two different Greek words synonyms that are not. The Greek word for wrath, which is orge, and the Greek word for tribulation, delipsis. They are not the same thing. 
We have explained this many times. Tribulation comes from the devil. Wrath comes from God. We are not appointed unto wrath, but there will be a tribulation. Then we read that the Lord will come after the tribulation of those days. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. The tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky, power and great glory. Okay? And he will send his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four corners, from one end of the sky to the other. After the tribulation, this is the second problem we have. Our brethren who mistakenly believe in post-tribulationism. Now it does say the Lord will return after the tribulation. Unfortunately, they mean something different by the term tribulation than Scripture does. They think tribulation is the full seven years. They make the same mistake as the pre-trib people. The pre-trib people confuse tribulation with wrath, and they say the tribulation is this seven-year period, and the post-trib people say this is a seven-year period. It is not. The tribulation is one portion of the seven-year period. The beginning of birth pangs, okay, the beginning of birth pangs, the tribulation or the megat ellipse on the great tribulation, and then the day of his wrath, the day of his wrath. They're three different things, but they say, oh, he's coming at the end of the tribulation, therefore he's coming at the end of the seven years. He's not coming either before the seven years, at the beginning of it, nor at the end of it. They use different terms, or they use different definitions for terms than Scripture means by those terms. Yes, we are all post-tribulational, but that does not mean at the end of the seven years. Let's look. He will send his angels. Remember, there are two harvests. Not one, but two. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 14. We'll begin in verse 14. I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, a sickle for harvesting, obviously. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him, who sat on the throne, on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripened. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. That is what it's talking about in Matthew 24. That is the first harvest. That is the parousia. That is the rapture and the resurrection. That is the first harvest. Now, as we look in Matthew chapter 24, we see something that they will see the Son of the Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, the book of Revelation opens, opens with a reference to this event. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. 
Hence, Revelation 1-7, Zechariah 12-10, they'll look upon him who they had pierced, and what we see in Revelation 14, all speak of the same event. All speak of the same event. Almost exact wording in the original Greek text and in any good translation. It's almost the exact wording. Now, when you see more than one text saying the same thing in the same words, they illuminate each other. They illuminate each other. People who speculate about the parousia and they become dogmatic about it being pre or post or this. They're failing linguistically. They're making words synonyms that aren't. But they're also, among many other failures, not properly interpreting scripture in light of scripture. When the same thing is said in multiple scriptures, they explain each other. They illuminate each other. Let's go further. Revelation 14, that is the first harvest. That is the parousia. Now let's look at verse 17 of Revelation 14. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters and the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside of the city, and the blood came from the winepress up to the horses' bridles for distance of 200 miles. Now this is incredible. It's extending all the way from the Valley of Jehoshaphat, at least that's what it would, would, would appear to be, because it's outside the city and it's where the return of Christ takes place underneath the Mount of Olives, underneath the Mount of Olives. Well, this is the second harvest. The grapes of wrath, like the novel by John Steinbeck, or the, the lyrics in the Battle Hymn of the Republic where the grapes of wrath are stored. This is the second harvest. The unsaved, those who reject Christ, those who rebel against him, they are in the second harvest. The faithful church will be in the first harvest. The first harvest. There's the first harvest and the second. Very few escape the second harvest. Very few. A third of the Jews will escape, and a remnant of the Gentile nations. These are the people who will enter the millennial reign of Christ, uh, not counting us who are also in the millennium, but not in the sense they are. We will have glorified bodies. They will have bodies as we have now, only their descendants will have a very long longevity the way man did before the flood after Diluvian man. I hope that makes sense. So there's two harvests, two harvests, one harvest, two harvests. Now in Israel, there are two annual harvests, two harvests. There's the one in the spring, which is associated with the day of Pentecost. Hag Shavuot, the day of Pentecost. Then there's the other one associated with the Feast of Booths, Hag Sukkot, 
which of course represents the millennial kingdom being established. There's a difference. There's a different time frame. There's a gap period in between the two. There's a gap period in between the two. Well, let's look a little bit further at this particular subject of the parousia, the rapture. Is it countdown, stand down, or is it lockdown? Or is it all of the three? Let's begin with countdown. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Now remember, in the second harvest, the fire is taken from the altar, the fire of judgment. Most of you know, but in case you don't, the word here is stoichia for elements, elemental chemistry. Before Einstein, before the 20th century, no one imagined you could dissolve an atom to get explosive energy from it let alone destroy the earth that way in significant quantities. This was long before uranium-238 or, or plutonium or critical mass was understood. Peter says that the elements are going to be dissolved with fire to the degree the earth can be destroyed. But we're told to hasten the day of his coming, looking forward to and hastening. Two Greek words here, prostokantes, prostokantes. This means hoping it happens, hoping it happens. You want Jesus to come back. Remember the Song of Solomon, do not awaken my beloved until she pleases. The bridegroom will not come for the bride until she really wants him to come. As we've said, we are not waiting for the Lord. The Lord is waiting for the bride to get dressed, to be perfected. Hoping, longing, longing for him to come. That is what it means. Only the faithful church will want Jesus to come. The world will not want him to come. It's in the power of the wicked one. And the harlot church will not want him to come. Remember when Jesus came the first time and Herod heard from the wise men about the arrival of the true king of the Jews. And it says in the Nativity narrative in Matthew, that he mourned and all Jerusalem with him. Even though they were the people of God, the city of God, they expected the Messiah to come. They had the scriptures. They had 2,000 years of history going back to Abraham. They had all of this. We talk about this in our nativity teaching. When Christ comes back, most people will not want him to come. I don't mean just the world. That's obvious. If you look at the east gate of Jerusalem, the Pasha, the Turks, built a wall in front of the gate and shut it because they knew that the Jews believed the Messiah would have to come through it. It's one thing when Islam does not want Jesus to come or the world does not want him to come. But what happens when the so-called church doesn't want him to come? The church in the broad sense of the word. 
Well, let's look even further. The other term here in Peter is splintes. Splintes. It means to urge and to hasten. We can make him come back faster. We can make him come back faster. We've explained this many times. My apologies to those who know it. In eternity, Jesus may now know the day of his return, but when he was here, he didn't. Only the Father knew. Because relative to us, not to eternity, but relative to us, where there is time, linear time, it's a variable. It is a variable. Do not awaken my beloved until she pleases. As we'll see in a moment, Jesus told us this directly. Spuentes, hastening his coming, urging him to come. Let's look at the hastening first. The hastening first. There are multiple aspects of the hastening. One is when the number of the elect is saved. Two is Judeo-centric. It's something to do with the salvation of Israel in the last days. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 10. When Jesus sends the apostles out in pairs, he makes it very clear that they will not finish doing this. They will not finish evangelizing the Jews. Now, obviously, he's not talking about then. He's talking about the end of the age. What happened then was only a partial fulfillment. And he said in Matthew chapter 10, you will not complete going through all the cities of Jerusalem, of Israel, until the Son of Man comes. You won't finish the task. It's not going to happen. Now, Matthew 24 and 25 is the Olivet Discourse. It is one of Jesus' teachings on his return in Matthew. There is a shorter, condensed version of it in Matthew 10, when he sends the apostles out in pairs. And he says many of the same things. They'll bring you before governors and kings, and, and it'll be an opportunity for your testimony. Don't worry about what you're going to say, and things of this particular nature. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake, when they persecute you in this place, go to another. But in Matthew 10, 23, whenever they persecute you in one place, flee to the next. For I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Right now we can know that the evangelization of Israel of the reborn Jewish state will not be completed before he comes. Through evangelizing the Jews in Israel and the Arabs in Israel, through the evangelization of Israel, we hasten his coming. It will not be completed before he comes. He'll come back before Israel is completely evangelized. I remember in the 1970s, there were about 200 known believing Jews in Israel and a few thousand believing Arabs. There were more believing Arabs then than there were believing Jews. Now, the number of Arabs has increased somewhat, but the numbers of Jews who believe has increased dramatically. While there were a few hundred in the 1970s, no one can tell you how many there are today, but we're certainly speaking in the thousands. 
Now, those numbers have been blown out of proportion, embellished, <coughs> exaggerated, but there are certainly thousands. Thousands. I knew at one time when every Jew in Israel who believed was known by every other one. There would have been very few Jews who believed who every other believer in the country did not know who they were, uh, at least every other Jewish believer. That's no longer the case. There's too many. Nobody's even sure how many congregations there are because some of them are house congregations of people in Russia and so forth, speaking Russian and so forth. It's happening. Matthew 10 is happening. And the process of the re-evangelization of Israel will not be complete before Jesus comes. So the fullness of the Gentiles coming in is one way to hasten his coming, missions and evangelism. The second is the evangelization of Israel and the Jews. That's the second. That's the second way. But there's another way. Again, another meaning to the word spuentes. To urge. To urge. The early Christians had a standard salutation when they wrote something and a standard greeting. Ma, and from Aramaic, Mar Anata, Mar Anata, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. They wanted him to come. By desiring his return earnestly and living our lives accordingly, not just lip service, but by seriously desiring his coming, we can make it happen faster. I was thinking this morning in my own devotions, as I often do and in my daily prayers, the persecuted church, perhaps, if not probably, the most persecuted church in the world, even worse than, than, than Iran, is North Korea. It is unspeakable what happens to believers and their families in North Korea. Those believers in North Korea have only one hope. Either the Lord's going to come or he's going to come for them. Nothing else. They have nothing in this life to hope in, to trust in, to want, to desire. Nothing. The only way they're going to get out unless that regime falls is Christ returning or them going to be with him. Only ways. Now understand this. South Korea. South Korea is the evangelical Bible belt of Asia. Uh, it has a higher percentage of believers out of the national demographic than any other country. China overall has more believers but as a percentage of the population, South Korea has the most. There's some good churches and some bad ones, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it has the most people professing to be born again in Asia per capita. It's, it's South Korea. On one side of the, I think it's the 17th parallel, on one side, you've got the largest evangelical church in the Far East. In Asia. On the other side, you have the most persecuted one. Both of them are Koreans. Both of them are Koreans. Now, in South Korea, the big churches have the same kinds of problems you'd see in the United States, South Africa, Britain with the money preachers and the nonsense and the false doctrine. Their biggest pastor, Young Yi Chao, was found guilty as a swindler, uh, criminally convicted. He had the biggest church in Asia, one of the biggest churches in the world, maybe the biggest. Uh, it's a corrupt church. Not all of it, but a lot of it. No, it is not ready for Jesus to come, most of it. But in North Korea, those people... They're desperate for Jesus to come. 
at the close of the age, the church becomes so worldly. The church of Laodicea becomes so materialistic and so blind that persecution becomes a necessary evil. Persecution becomes a necessary evil. Otherwise, they will not want Jesus to come. This is unfortunate, but it is the unfortunate reality. That is why God allows the persecution in part. So the first aspect of the parousia is the question, is there a countdown? Is there a countdown? Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 4. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. When does that happen in Revelation chapter 14? When does that happen? When does what we read in Matthew 24 take place? When does it happen? When is this harvest? When the crop permits. From this aspect, we are not waiting for the Lord, as we've said multiple times. He is waiting for us. We can make it happen faster. The fullness of the Gentiles coming in, desiring his coming, the salvation of Israel, and the bride becoming spotless and cleaning up her act. Don't awaken her until she pleases. The second aspect is not countdown, but stand down. Stand down. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 24 once again. We're told what society is going to generally be like. The day of the hour no one knows in verse 36. It'll be like the days of Noah. In those days, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Remember, the Antichrist will bring a false peace, a false prosperity to the world. People will become celebratory. People will think or be deluded, tricked, as it were, seduced spiritually into thinking things are actually improving. This is one of the ways the Antichrist will ingratiate himself. He'll come into power after a chain of global disasters, including pestilences, famines, wars, rumors of wars, and he will bring a false peace and prosperity. He will attempt to counterfeit the millennial reign of Christ. And people will think they can go back to normal, and they'll begin trusting in this life or this world. They won't know it. They'll have no idea. But in verse 45, who then is the faithful and sensible servant whom his master puts in charge of his household to give the proper food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master finds him so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. Now, this obviously has a reference to the millennium and so forth, status and position in the millennium. But 
if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. <laughs> the master of the servant will come a day that he does not expect at an hour which he does not know and will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the evildoers, with the lost, as it were, with the hypocrites, hypocrites in Greek. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is very frightening, very frightening. There are leaders in the church today who began right. They began honest. They began preaching and teaching the truth. They even began heralding the soon coming return of Christ in relative terms. They were right. They taught the truth. But two things happen. The first is the beating of the fellow servants. We've warned about this many times. It comes from the book of Ezekiel chapter 34. It comes from the book of Revelation chapters 2 with the Nicolaitans. The general colloquialism we use is heavy shepherding. Sheep abusing leadership. Sheep abusing leadership it becomes cultic it is a related but separate subject there's three things to always look out for when you see this happening one is exploitation fleecing the sheep for their own aggrandizement two text ploitation they begin corrupting the word of God doctrinally. Three, sexploitation. When you have that kind of power, Paul warns about those who captivate weak women unaware and things of this nature. You get the Jim Baker, week before last it was Carl Lynn, take your pick. The Hillsong thing, immorality. What lords these leaders? What lures them? What draws them into it? They eat and drink with the drunken. They become absorbed with this party that the world is having, oblivious to what is really transpiring. They become deluded. They think the Lord is not coming soon. I have time. I can continue doing this. Now, again, many of these people began right. They began teaching the truth. This is very frightening, particularly to those who are pastors or Bible teachers or positions of leadership. It's a perilous time. False religion seduces in the character of the woman Jezebel. Jesus spoke of her in Revelation chapter 2. Look at what she says in the book of Proverbs. Chapter 7, verse 19. Let us drink, let us eat, a love to fill to morning, she says. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. My husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. Well, no, the moon will be darkened when he comes. <laughs> there will be a full moon at some point when the church is giving the most light of the sun, but the moon is darkened when he comes. 
My husband's not at home. Let's have a party. He's delayed. He's not coming back. I'm telling you, this is what we see now. And we've warned about it many times. Many times. That's what you see in back of people like Mike Bickle. Uh, it's what you see on back of the New Apostolic Reformation. It's certainly what you see on back of Rick Warren telling Christians, teaching Christians to avoid end time prophecy, actually contradicting the direct instructions of Jesus. This is Rick Warren. Avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. And this is what Proverbs warns about false religion saying that the return of the husband. The bridegroom is delayed. Uh, Matthew 24. Uh, my master is delayed. He's going to tarry. Well, look with me, please, to the book of the Hebrew prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come and will not fail. The vision is the chazon, chazon. In the book of Revelation in Hebrew, the apocalypse is called chazon Yochanan. These things we see in the book of Revelation Though it tarries, in its time it's going to come and it will not delay. It will come and it will not delay. I've explained this before, but we have some newcomers. I'll go through it quickly. When the scripture says Jesus is coming soon, many people misunderstand what that means. They say, oh, he said that 2,000 years ago and he hasn't come yet. Jesus is coming quickly, quickly. It means if you're waiting for a train at a railway station and the train is delayed, okay, the train is delayed. But when it pulls into the station, it arrives quickly. And because it's trying to make up time, it loads up the passengers, discharges the passengers, loads up as quickly as possible and moves out quickly. It comes quickly and it leaves quickly. That's the way the rapture will be. It's like a late train. The parousia will be like a late train. It's delayed for certain reasons. The bride is not ready to get on board and God is showing his grace to the unsaved, to give them an opportunity to get saved before it's too late to come into the first harvest instead of the second. Oh, it's delayed, but it will not delay when it arrives, when the time comes. The term in Hebrew here is hake, hake. You would say, take rega, wait a minute. Something's going to happen quickly. Just wait a minute. It's going to happen. You don't have to wait long. It's going to come. Okay, okay. But the other term is yit mamo. Yit mamo shall not be delaying. Shall not be delaying. When it happens, it's going to happen fast. And you have to be ready for it to happen. You have to desire for it to happen. And you can actually make it happen sooner to a degree. So we have countdown and stand down. Both are simultaneously true. But then we have the third. Look with me, please to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, 
But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. To stay. This word in Greek in Luke 24 is kathasete. Kathasete. Get the word cathedral. Get the word cathedral is a Latinization that comes from it. Kathasete. To wait. To wait. Yes, there is a countdown. Yes, there is a stand down. But then there is a lockdown. The apostles were in the upper room waiting. There was nothing they could do after a certain point but wait. Jesus went to send the Holy Spirit, and he says, wait. Now, the Holy Spirit was still in the hearts of the apostles and the 120. When Jesus rose, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I'll never leave you or forsake you. The Lord's Spirit will never be taken from the faithful believers. But it will be taken from the world. And it will no longer, his spirit will no longer empower the church or unite the church. It will only be in the hearts of believers who are faithful to the Lord, desiring his coming, the way it was between the ascension and the day of Pentecost. That happens again. We deal with this in the book, Arpeso. All you will be able to do is wait and anticipation. There'll be no power to do anything. Again, the reference, work while you have the light, night will come, no man can work. There came a time when Noah and his family had to get on the ark and God's hand shut the hatch. That hatch is going to be slammed shut again by the hand of God himself. What did his family do? The world mocked them. Noah preached for 120 years, it is reckoned. The world mocked him and his family. But once it began to rain, <laughs> they weren't mocking anymore, and it was too late for them to build a boat or to get on one. God closed the door. All they had to do was sit there and wait for the rain to come. Well, the rain is going to come. Wait. Kathasete. A time will come when our work will be finished and all we can do is wait for the return of Jesus. This will indeed happen. This will happen. Now, the book that's coming out next, Lord willing, No Bomb and Gilead, we explain something. The faithful church cannot know the day or the hour of his return. Cannot know the day or the hour. But you can know certain things that are going to happen after the church is removed. There will be a refulfillment of the autumn holy days of Israel. I'm sorry, a refulfillment of the spring holy days and a primary fulfillment of the autumn holy days. Things will happen on those literal days. But that is when the faithful church is removed and God has turned his purpose back to Israel and the Jews. We can't know the day. But we can get distracted. Then we won't know the day. But we can join the party and we won't be ready for the day. Countdown. 
Yeah, the clock, is, the clock is ticking, but we don't know what time the timer is set for. We don't know because the explosion will happen when the crop permits. It depends on us. Secondly, there's a stand down. In his mercy, he is delaying. For myself, you for yourself, you want Jesus to come back. But if you have unsaved family, unsaved or backslidden children, unsaved loved ones, Lord, please delay. <laughs> for ourselves, we want him to come. For the sake of the lost, we want him to wait. There's a tension. Well, stand by. Okay. When it happens, yit mamo, he will not be delayed. Lockdown, catasete. No, this is not the real lockdown yet. This lockdown we have now may prefigure a coming lockdown. <laughs> it may hint that it's coming, but this is not it. There will be a lockdown. Catasete. All we do is hibernate and wait. Our work will be finished. He shall come. This subject of the parousia is a massive one. Tonight, I just wanted to look at certain aspects of it in light of what is happening now. Not just in the world, but in the church. The world is the world. We see the way it's going. Okay. But the church, be careful of these brethren who are so caught up in the conspiracy things. And they're always worried about this and that. And have you heard? They're not putting the emphasis where the scripture does. Not that it's wrong to be aware of those things, but that becomes their obsession. It's a diversion. It's a trick. Second, as the pre-tribulational position collapses because more and more Christians are leaving it, the Holy Spirit is showing them it's not true. Its proponents are becoming more and more desperate to defend it to the point where they're making it a fundamental. Some of them are actually making it a fundamental. If you don't believe it, you're not a Christian, they say. Uh, or, or, or you're backslidden, or you're, you're, you're false brothers. There's this chap running around England called Snowden in Oxford who who has this view, who propounds this. J.D. Farragut, these people in America, and, and the, uh, Amir Safadi, they're getting more and more desperate. They're getting desperate to the point where they're saying that the apostasy, the falling away is the rapture. Traditional pre-tribulationists never believe this. They are getting more desperate to defend that position. Watch out for it. Watch out for it. Thirdly, watch out for the bunker mentality. Oh, that's it. It's all hopeless. All we can do is wait for the Lord to rescue us. We've not reached that point yet. That point is coming, and it may be coming very rapidly. But we are not there yet. We have to hasten his coming. We have to work while we have the light, for that night is indeed coming when no man will be able to work. And again, do not be seduced by the trends of the world getting into the church. 
You look at these people with the dominion theology and the kingdom now and the new apostolic reformation and the ecumenical movement and the word faith money preachers, all of these seductions are to take our eyes off the return of Christ and to get us to hope somehow in what God's doing here and now. Well, what God's really doing here and now is he's warning people to repent and he's warning the church to get ready because Jesus is indeed coming. These are the realities. There's a countdown. There's a stand down. And there will be a lockdown. But these things, although on the horizon, although on the horizon, are not yet. But what we see happening in the world and in the church assure us it won't be long in coming. Hake. As Habakkuk wrote, Yit Mamo, in the time, in his time, he shall not delay. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Jacob, thank you. A lot of stuff to go through there as usual. We've been blessed by your message tonight. Thank you, brother. If I can just remind people why Jacob just cut his a, 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 a rest by for a couple of seconds. Most of you tonight were emailed from uh, RTN TV's uh, mailbox. For anyone who wasn't directly emailed from RTN, this is the last evening where we will be sending out separate emails. From here on in, if you want to participate in the program, in the Bible study, you will need to subscribe to RTN, where we can then send out the emails in batch. Then we know many's been received. We can manage it a lot easier rather than lots of separate emails from different people. It doesn't mean you can't share it amongst friends, but we need to be able to manage it and control it. So if you haven't already registered on the RTN site, go to rtntv.org. It's a simple process. Just put in your email address and your name. That will automatically then include you in our mail drop, any future programs or events, which more we else look RTN TV are organizing. You'll be aware of it in advance, and if you wish to take part, then you'll have free access to do so. So thank you for that. Uh, we're not going to go into the, the part of the program for questions. If any of you do have any questions, um, all you need to do is simply unmute your microphone, and that will then allow you to... Yeah, they have to be relevant to the subject tonight. Absolutely, Jacob. That's very, very important. Just on that, Jacob... I was going to ask a question, but I'm not going to ask that specific question tonight. But what su suddenly struck me was something that the parallel um, imagery from the children of Israel. Moses went up onto the mountain. He wasn't long gone until the family, the Johanna, That's suddenly right. went crazy. And then as a result of that, we see that the chaos, that none of them actually entered the promised land. That's correct. And I looked at this, and I remember a little while ago, I spoke to this uh, to... Um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and what you said about that generation which will go into the thousand year reign, he equated it very similar to they would be the younger generation. In most westernized uh, countries, UK, states, etc., we have a legal term called Dorley Incapax, which is that age of criminal responsibility. Yes. And it's, it's identical more or less to the Bar Mitzvah in Jewish uh, custom. Yes. Of age. What he was trying to say effectively was that they will be the people, the sons of, the younger children of those who are part of that second harvest, but they will be that second harvest, that younger, by and large, that younger generation who may do naughty things but aren't, as far as the Lord's concerned, criminally responsible because they don't actually understand their actions. Would you concur with that? I would concur that children who have not reached the age of responsibility the Lord will not hold them responsible for their sin, yeah. and the blood of Jesus atones for it. But it depends on the age of the children. Remember, and the number 42 was significant, just like it was in Revelation. Yeah. When the bears devoured the boys who mocked Elisha, remember? Yeah. Now, they were young people. They, they were young people. So what I would generally agree with him, broadly speaking, I could not be overly dogmatic. On the age. Yeah, yeah because also 
Um, Caleb and Joshua came out of Egypt. So they would not have been in the younger generation. They would have been in the older generation as well. Mm. And they entered the promised land. That's important because Caleb is a Kenizzite, a Gentile convert to Judaism, and then Joshua. So it shows a remnant of Jews and a remnant of Gentiles will enter the millennium. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. It's really important. Has anyone got any questions for Jacob? If you do, simply unmute your microphone and the uh, platform is all yours. Yes, I do. This is Terry oh. Milholland. Hi, please go ahead, brother. Yes, uh, Jacob, thank you. Um, quick question. Does, do, does the Abraham Treaty have an impact on your, your teaching about Perusa? It is absolutely one of the events transpiring in the Middle East that is setting the stage for what ultimately will be the Shikusa Meshomen, the abomination of desolation. Revelation chapter 11 tells us that there'll be some kind of a division of the Temple Mount with the Tribulational Temple. And there is going to, of necessity, be some kind of a temporary, at least partial, but artificial peace between Jew and Arab. Again, there'll be a real reconciliation between Jew and Arab with the return of Christ, but the Antichrist will attempt to counter for that. I see the Abraham Accords. Uh, right now, it's focused in Abu Dhabi, is where their worship center is, in Abu Dhabi. With Antichrist, it will not be in Abu Dhabi, it'll be on the Temple Mount, but it is moving that direction. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you very much for that question. Anyone else got a question for Jacob? Yes, may I? Please. Thank you. I've always wondered, Jacob, uh, the reaping. Oh, who's, who's talking? Cayenne or Leanne? I don't know. I don't know. recognize your voice. What's your name? Uh, I'm unmuted. Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much. I've always wondered... Uh, the reaping in Revelation 14, is it not chronological after the trumpets? You're still sticking that back into the... Okay, the portions of Revelation that are chronological are the sets of seven. Seven churches, seven um, seals, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven peals of thunder. The fifth is followed by the sixth, the sixth is by the seventh. Those things are always chronological, okay? But that those sets of seven are punctuated by retelling the same story in the sets of sevens from a different perspective. In other words, it explains what happens in the sets of seven. If you look at the end, for instance, of the seven seals and the seven trumpets in Revelation, okay, and that continues up until you get to chapter 9, okay, um, the fifth trumpet, and then you go on to chapter 11 to the seventh trumpet. Chapters 12, chapter 13, Chapter 14, chapter 15, all the way to chapter 16, 12 through 16, go back and retell what happens with the seals and the trumpets. The chronology only resumes when you get to chapter 16 with the vials of wrath. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> the sets of seven are punctuated by, as it were, further revelation or illumination of what was just said. What happens with the seals and what happens with the trumpets is explained in chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. The chronology resumes in chapter 16. That's the literary structure of revelation. Okay? Does that answer your question? 
Yes, yes, I guess. So like 14 is just an, a deeper look into the seals. And then you, because... Uh, yes, it is. Well, yes, it is. It retells the same thing. It retells the same thing. Yes, okay. But the main thing with chapter 14 is, again, there's two harvests. Yes. Two. Okay. Where, where are you? You're in Canada? I'm down near Marcos Church, Santa Clarita. Oh, you're in, you're in Southern Marcos. California. Yeah. Okay. Where are you, Santa, Santa where? Santa Clarita. Oh, Santa Clarita. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Liam. Good question. If any of you are asking a question tonight and you're, you're off put by the lag of the internet, just carry on speaking as you would normally. It will eventually catch up. Depending on where you're connecting in from across the world, it just takes a little while longer sometimes for the switching to tech process. Who's, got, who's next for the question? Yeah, I must, yes. uh, yeah, go ahead. I must come here. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Okay, um, it's uh, something of a, uh, Jacob, you're talking about um, the way uh, certain teachers are getting very desperate. And something I'm picking up is that there's a desperation in the flock that it, they're almost paranoid. If Jesus doesn't come back quickly, what are we going to do? And I, one of the things that is concerning me that people could end up losing their faith because they're putting their faith in an event instead of in Christ himself. I don't know if I would express it that way, but it is absolutely true that people who are taught wrong doctrines of the parousia, such as pre-trib, are being placed in peril. They're being set up. Somehow they imagine that living in California or in Cornwall or in, you know, or in Saskatchewan immunizes them from what's happening to Christians in China or, or North Korea or Iran. Hmm. Um, again, they, they are reinterpreting the scriptures in light of their own historical and cultural experience. Okay? They don't say you'll be hated by all nations on account of my namesake. Mm -hmm. The people who've been fed this stuff, and particularly the people who've been fed the Benny and Kenny stuff, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid, name it and claim it. Those people are absolutely being set up for the falling away, yes. They're being set up for the apostasy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the, the one of the real dangers at the moment is uh, Tommy Ice with all this business. Oh, about. yeah, he's, he's, uh, but he's one of the chief people who has said that the apostasy is the rapture. Yeah, that was never believed by traditional pre tribulationism. Never. Uh, but and it's been his, his, he, he's be, he's behaving like a pseudo academic. He's not even behaving in a, in a scholarly, responsible manner. No, I mean, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew or a Greek scholar, but even chasing back through the Septuagint, uh, the term that's used in that uh, Thessalonian letter, every time you pick it up in a Septuagint, uh, it's talking about, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, not an, it's not a rapture, it, it's, it's bad news. It's yes. bad news. But Thomas Ice, you're correct, but he's also engaged in revisionism. He's rewriting church history. Yeah, but there's a lot of people picking up and running with it. Of course, because if, if, if the world was getting worse and somebody was telling you what you want to hear instead yeah. of what you need to hear, there's a market for the product. Yeah. It's an yeah. interesting situation, Steve, and I don't say this in any way to deride Amir Safarti and his ministry, but they actually have one of the biggest parts of their ministry is dealing with people who are contemplating suicide because the rapture hasn't happened. They've been force-fed it so intensively that it's not happening. And they see the things happening in the world that a large part of their ministry is now spent counseling and addressing issues of suicide of people who support Amir, J.D. Farag, and that really intensive side of the whole pre-trib part of the family. And that's a big worry and a big concern, yeah. I think. Too true, yeah, very much so. Was there someone else with a question? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Go ahead, please. 
Um, mine's a two-part question, if you don't mind. Um, I've just recently turned 21, so this, this has kind of been like rattling my brain a bit. But um, I've always sort of worried about like, you know, how to sort of, um, how to like deal with this whole issue of, you know, like Jesus will be coming soon, how to prepare for that, how to look forward to that. But at the same time, still wanting to be able to do certain things like marriage or have children. A very children. good question. A very good question. This is the answer. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Prepare, I mean, plan for the future, but don't plan on it. Plan for the future, but mm -hmm. don't plan on on it. One of the most incredible American basketball games I ever watched was with an American basketball player called Michael Jordan. And you have to stay up, you know, in the middle of the night to watch American sports if you live in Britain because of the time difference. And the team he played for at the time was Chicago and Chicago Bulls. And they were trailing very narrowly. At the last second, the last second in, in, in the game, in the final quarter, the last second, he makes an incredible shot and sinks the basket, and the game is won. The return of Christ will be the same thing. It'll seem, through Antichrist, as if Satan has won. But it all changes like that. Professional athletes, rugby, basketball, whatever, it doesn't matter how long there is in the game. The conclusion of the game can be the most important. They play with the same intensity and the same determination right up until the clock stops. That needs to be our mentality. Don't worry, the clock will stop. Until then, you continue playing as if you've got an hour left in the game. Plan for the future. Education, career, business, family. Plan for the future, but don't plan on it. Now, as far as matrimony, commit your work to the Lord. Your plans will be established. Uh if the Lord wants you to marry someone, uh, you commit that relationship to him. Mm -hmm. it's, remember, marriage is what God joined together. <laughs> yeah. Let God join together. Otherwise, don't do it. <laughs> okay? You know, I've always um, been prepared for the fact that maybe God will want me you know, to not marry, so I could extend myself to some kind of ministry. But you know, it's always just worth you know, always try and be prepared for whatever way God wants. Uh, yes. He'll give you the grace to do what he wants you to do. You mentioned being single for the sake of the ministry. Marriage is the natural state that God ordained for man. That was the natural state. He made the male and female. However, because of the fall of man and the urgency of mission, as you put it, some people have a higher calling. People who have the grace to stay single. But when God gives that grace to somebody, it's inevitably related to something he's called them to do. For instance, if somebody is smuggling Bibles into Iran, they don't need a wife and kids waiting for them back in Ohio because they might not be coming home or I know a medical missionary in Africa, born in England, but grew up in America, but she's English, educated in the States. She's a medical missionary, and she takes care of AIDS babies. She takes care of perhaps 30 or 40 of them at a time. She could not have a baby or a child of her own. She's got these other 30 very sick babies to look after. God gave her the grace to be single, <laughs> okay? When somebody is given the grace to be single, 
it is always related to the nature of the ministry God has called them to, where a wife would not be a helpmeet, but an obligation that will hold you back, or conversely with a woman as well. You're not called to be a helpmeet to a husband. You're called to get on with something else God has called you to. Now, the second thing you see when God has given that grace is this. Women who have that grace do not lose their femininity. And males who are given that grace do not lose their masculinity. You look at these guys, these old bachelors who've been pressing their own shirts too long. Those guys should have got married 25, 30 years ago. They get dainty in their old age. I don't mean homosexual, but they be, but or effeminate in the, in the sense of a sexual perversion, but they become like picky old women, you know what I mean? <laughs> so too, when a woman has been chopping the firewood too long, she masculinizes. If somebody actually has the grace from the Lord to be single for the sake of the ministry, it does not affect their sexuality except that their sexuality is controlled. It does not affect their masculinity or their femininity. The third thing you will find when God has given someone the grace to remain single for the sake of the ministry is this. Not only are they not sexually hung up and battling lust all the time, but they have a peace about it. They're not worried about being alone or being old and all this, They're not having a spouse to look after them when they're geriatric patients. Those things don't bother them. So if somebody is called to remain single for the sake of the ministry, one, the ministry will be there, and it will be obvious that marriage is just not on the agenda to do this. Second, it's not going to affect their masculinity or their femininity or their sexuality in any adverse or unnatural sense. And thirdly, they'll have a peace about it. They won't be worrying about getting old and being alone. Those are the three things. Now, if all of those three things are not there, you should probably get married if, if you want to. Yeah, I okay. hope that and, helps. Yeah, it does help. And um, you mentioned career, right? About your playing career. One of the things I did want to also ask is, um, obviously, I, obviously I know that evangelism is one of the most important things to do, especially during this time as we things draw to a close. But I was also wondering about what other sort of careers do you think Christians could focus on? You know, like, because I've been thinking about, you know, wanting to do more like, art and stories because I've been looking at the world and thinking, there's just so much darkness now. I just want to put some more biblical light out there. But I don't want, but as I said, I don't want to get distracted. I want to focus on what I think God would actually want me to do. Look, so, commit your work to the Lord. Your plans will be established in terms of a career. Very briefly, there's one verse I can show you. Look at Matthew 25, the second half of the Olivet Discourse, and Matthew 25, okay? The parable of the talents in verse 14. A man about to go on a journey representing Christ, who called the servants and entrusted them his possessions, okay? To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Each according to his own ability each according to his own ability. God has given us natural abilities to advance his kingdom, natural aptitudes, natural talents, natural interests. He's given us natural abilities that have to be taken to the cross, of course, and submitted to his lordship, but natural abilities are God-given, but spiritual gifts are God-given. Spiritual gifts and natural abilities are not the same thing, but there is a correspondence between them. For instance, a barrister or a Shakespearean actor may be a very good evangelist, or a linguist, someone good with languages, may be a very effective missionary. There are countries in the world that will never allow in a missionary or an evangelist but they will allow in a physician or a dentist or a nurse, or they will allow in an, an agronomist. 
Uh, and that is the way that the gospel has gotten into certain countries uh, through, through secular professions that, that God has used. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. As far as a desire to use your career to serve the Lord, the clearest passage I know of in the New Testament is Matthew 25. Uh, there is a correspondence between uh, ability and gifting and, and calling. The other is in the Old Testament, where they built the ark, remember? They built the ark, and it said God gave them wisdom. You know what I mean? Now, yeah. there it's not talking about chokhmah or spiritual wisdom as such. It's talking about a practical craftsmanship, you know? Yeah. Again, natural abilities are also God-given, but they have to be under the Lordship of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's about all I can tell you at the moment because of the for format. Great, great question, no, Kayan. If, if it helps, uh, I know a brother who's a pastor in India to the lowest of the low in the caste system. They don't read. And they don't write. So there's no point in him giving them the Bible. There's no point in him showing them scripture. He does all his teaching pictorially. And as it turns out, he's quite a good artist. So he just carries a mm. flip chart and he draws the Bible. He draws the narrative. And they remember that. And that's how he works. That's what the Lord's called him to do. Very unusual. You wouldn't need it in the UK. But because of the education and their, their status in India... That's probably the only way that's available. The Lord's called him to do that with those given abilities he has as an artist, but also as an evangelist. So never discount your skills or abilities. The Lord can always use them. As Jacob says, put them before the Lord. You might be surprised, brother. Anyone else got a question? Yes, please. Yes, yes please. please. Oh, okay. Who said yes, please? Yes, please. I did. Uh, Christoph. Christoph. Oh, okay. Christoph, please go ahead. A uh, short question. Um, we are in a gap between 69th and 70th week of Daniel 9, right? That's and correct. after the rapture, okay, in the Millennium Kingdom, if I get it correct, uh, in the Millennium Kingdom, there will be two kinds of people. People from the church that had been raptured, and then they are going back with, the, uh, with Jesus. Or resurrected as well. Resurrected, yeah. Plus Jews that had survived God's wrath. Not wrath just Jews, there'll be a remnant of the nations as well. Remnant of the nation. Because I wanted to ask you to advise and help me understand what kind of nations John is prophesying in um, chapter 20, verse 8. The Satan will gather the nations from the corners of the earth. Yeah, the nations are ethnon, you know? Ethnon. Ethnon. Ethnic. Get the word ethnic. Wow. Like, you're... you're, you're nation would be Slavic, okay? Somebody in Wales would, would be Celtic. You know, somebody in Africa would be, would be African, you know. The nations always comes somehow, directly or indirectly, from the table of nations in Genesis 10. That's the basis of biblical anthropology, the table of nations in Genesis 10, which in turn derive from the three sons of Noah. Right. Okay? Right. Ham, Japheth, and, and Shem, okay? Thank you so much. Okay. I have a question. Uh, I'll just ask a quick question. One at a time. I think, Mike, you were there first. Okay. Okay. Um, you talked <clears throat> in your talk about the evangelization of the Jews. Yes. I've always thought um, in my walk, that there, there would come a time when anybody supporting Israel and supporting the ministries that help Israel, that there would be a time when the Messianic ministries, the real ministries that are reaching the Jewish people and the Arab people and are not compromising, you know, they're doing it because they want the gospel to, yes. to reach the Jews and the Arabs. Do you think we're at that point? Because there's still so many Christians supporting ministries that are helping the Jews, but, you know, 
they're not focusing okay. on the well, evangelism. I'm pro-Zionist. I believe in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. Why am I pro-Zionist? Because in Zechariah 12, Jesus is. Okay. <laughs> he, he's going to intervene on behalf of those trying to destroy them. Okay. However, those who are trying to help the Jews but were, are withholding the gospel, are withholding the good news of their Messiah, the only thing they're doing is helping the Jews go to hell. The two are not mutually exclusive. These organizations that have done this or who do this, Exobus V1, they have an unevangelistic policy. The so-called International Christian Embassy, which scripturally is neither Christian or an embassy, or Bridges for Peace, if there's no Christ, there's no peace. Um, these organizations have a simple message. We love you, Jew. Go to hell. Yeah. Enter eternity without your Messiah. We just want to love you so much. We'll help you get there by withholding the gospel. We are told in Romans chapter Romans 10, I will require there with no preacher, how shall they hear? Ezekiel and Paul both say, and specifically about the Jews, although it's a general truth, I will require their blood of your hands. Mm. <laughs> but no, you, Christian you... Should support, no Christian should support any ministry that is not evangelistic. Now, this mm. you ask it about Jewish evangelism, okay, that's specific. And there's a scriptural emphasis on Jewish evangelism in that regard. But you look at things like uh, Bernardo's, most of the Salvation Army, World Vision, most of those Christian aid, most of those organizations began as gospel preaching. Most, but they no longer are. <laughs> they have a purely social gospel. Oh, we're going to care for the poor. We're going to care for the poor so much we're going to let them go to hell without Christ. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Now, if we try to evangelize poor people and we let them go hungry or they physically hungry or without shelter or things of this nature or medical attention, we're hypocrites. We have no witness or testimony. For them. <clears throat> On the other hand, just to try to meet someone's human need with a social gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. But, yeah. but my, my point is, though, you say that we can hasten the return of the Lord by focusing more on, on that particular part. So shouldn't we be helping ministries more that really are oh, reaching absolutely. out to, to his people? It is organizations that evangelize who, who should who are worthy or needy or deserving of the prayers and support of Christians, not the ones who withhold Christ. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Patricia Thanks, Lloyd, you're next. Yes. Uh, from Revelation um, regarding the last days, um, Revelation um, chapter 17. Yes. Um, I've always um, been learned that, that regarding the whore of Babylon uh, would be the Roman Catholic religion empire. And uh, from verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw upon the beast. Yeah, it says know, seven, I think it says seven tens and, head, and ten horns. Oh, okay. Doesn't it say seven and, heads and ten horns? I think it does. I, I, I'm quite sure it does. Probably, and yes, when you read it. I, it's it. first, let's see, Revelation 17. Look at 17.7. What does it say, 17.7? Yes, 17.7. And the angel said to me, Wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Right. That is the same as Revelation 12. And it's the same as Daniel, begins in Daniel chapter 7. It's the same. Yeah. Now, if yeah. you want to say that the Roman Catholic Church is historically and theologically 
part of the false religious system upon which the Antichrist will establish his kingdom, that is absolutely true. The Roman Church is a false religion, and it is the primary false religion that has counterfeited Christianity. But to say that that's the total meaning is not correct. It, okay. The total meaning goes beyond that. My question is, the beast and the beast kingdom um, will hate the whore. And yeah, God, once false religion, once false religion has served its purpose, the Antichrist will get rid of it. Yes. It, he no, wants to be worshipped. See, the Roman Catholic Church would still say it believes in Jesus, or the Greek Orthodox Church or the Byzantine Church would still profess to believe in Jesus. And someone, Antichrist doesn't want anything. He wants it all for yeah. Satan. You understand? He wants it all for Satan. The same as Yahweh in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures. So I'm the one true God. You have no other gods before me. Satan yeah. wants the same thing. No God but me. So yeah. once the false religions serve his purpose, he turns against them. Yes. Now, would that kingdom of the beast, would that be Islam? Since it, again, it will involve Islam, but it's not only Islam. The people who say these things, that it's Islam or it's Roman church, or things, they are correct in what they say. They are mistaken in what they fail to say. I see. But it's a huge subject. One book you might want was two books. I'm not trying to make a sales pitch here, but if you want to read the book uh, Shadows of the Beast, okay, and the other one would be Hard Paid. So those two books deal with these issues more than we would be able to do now. But when you see okay. people saying it's Islam or it's Rome and things, they're they're essentially right in what they say but wrong in what they failed to say. If that Thank you, Patricia. Sense. Really good question, Thank there, Patricia. Thank you. Tim, you've been patiently for a question? Oh, yes, just two comments. First of all, thank you very much, Jacob. Um, you clarified something for me regarding the tribulation, the distinction between the tribulation and God's wrath. Um, it's always concerned me that pre-trib rapture doctrine is so prevalent today. It's never sat very comfortably with me, and I thank you for making that distinction. Um, and is it possible to send either the notes, or do you have you a book or a book you can recommend that I could go into detail um, to teach? There's so many people asking me to teach clarity on this, and you've you've put a light on in my head, number one. Um, Jacob, number two, if I can squeeze a second question in, um, the people that teach pre-trib talk about, obviously, the removal of the church and the Holy Spirit. And I think it was Lance Lambert years ago when he was alive said, but if that's the case, how then do people get saved during the tribulation period? So, Jacob, could you shed some light for me on the, I think it's two Thessalonians two. Yeah, I know a seven, big subject. The mystery go into of in lawlessness is already at work. At the, at the oh, okay, okay. I can give you a I nutshell answer. That. I can give you a nutshell answer. Okay. okay. One of the mistakes sure. that pre-trib people make is they do not draw a distinction between the Holy Spirit indwelling and the Holy Spirit outpoured. Remember, oh, okay. after Jesus rose from the dead in John 20, verse 22, he breathes on the apostles and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The right. Messiah had died for our sins, rose from the dead, and at that point they became regenerate. They were born again. They were born of the Spirit. But then he told them, go wait for the Holy Spirit to be outpoured. Indeed, yeah. These people have a false eschatology, as it were, because they have what's known as a false pneumatology. They do not have a right understanding of the Holy Spirit. They think you're born again, and that's it. They're not drawing a distinction between John 20 and Pentecost. Okay? Right. Okay. That's, that's their first problem. The Holy Spirit will not be, as I said, 
not be taken from the hearts of the true believers, but he will be taken from the world. He will not convict the world right. of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, the second thing is, once the faithful church is removed, once that happens, the primary focus of God reverts to the salvation of Israel and the Jews. The age of the Gentiles is over. The primary focus. Most of what the book of Revelation tells us takes place following the parousia is the salvation of Israel. Now, very briefly, it'll be God dealing with Israel pretty much. It'll be... I don't want to use the term dispensationalism because it can be misunderstood. But God goes back to dealing the way he did in the Old Testament. Okay. He's focused on Israel. There's a temple. Okay? And it's no... The, the, the age of grace is over. Now he's the God of wrath, of anger. He's going back, doing what he did to Egypt and Exodus and things like that. He will deal with people the way he did then. Right, very okay. good. Now, yeah, sure. If, if you've got, again, the the book would be, I suppose Harpeza would be the book to read. Okay. 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 Jacob, can I be rude, really squeeze? You've just got another, you've, um, something else has come to me about the temple, which causes Christians to trip up a bit, because I believe there will be a temple built. Now, will that... Be will that be in the millennium or the peace? Well, there'll be a the tribulational temple in Revelation 11. To, to the best of my understanding, I'm, there has to be, and then it would seem. But then there will be a millennial temple. Right. Okay. Yeah. They're not the same, you know. Uh, okay, but clearly, without all the sacrifices and that, because obviously. We're living under God's Jesus' supreme sacrifice. In the millennium so, or in Revelation 11? The tribulation? To, oh, no, the millennium. In the millennium period. All right, well, that's really not tonight's subject. I will answer okay. very quickly, but I can't elaborate, okay? Sure. Okay, Jacob. Yeah, thank you. In, in the millennium, in the Old Testament, the temple sacrifices, the Levitical sacrificial system, were a way, among other things, a way to teach people about what the Messiah would do, what Jesus right. was going to do. Right. The Aaronic High Priest is a type of Christ, the Paschal Lamb, the Yom Kippur scapegoat, these things, of uh, the Yom Kippur goat, these things are pictures of Christ. Okay? Right. Sure. Okay. They were a way to, a shadow, a way to teach about what he was going to do. In the millennium, Satan will sure. be bound. Okay? Satan will be bound. Yeah. There won't be the world. Yeah. There will only be the earth. People born in the millennium will not have the same concept of sin we have. Think of a little baby, right. six right. months old, crawling on a carpet. The baby has no concept of sin. There is sin, but the baby has no concept of it. People right. in the millennium will be like that. They will not have the same concept of sin that we have. The sacrifices in the millennium will not be to take away sin. The blood of Jesus did that. Sure. But there will be a way to teach people at that time what the Messiah did do. In the Old okay. Testament... It teaches about what he was going to do in the sure. millennium, what he did do, the memorial. Right. Now, that's, the, again, a very concise, it's sure. a big subject. Yeah. Thank you very much I, for I your question, Tim. I really appreciate it. Jacob, yeah, thank you very much, just, Jacob. Would thank be you. Just for Jacob, for you to cover very quickly, you mentioned Thalipsis and you mentioned Orge. In, in relation to the end time and the confusion with one and the other. But in reality, there's an, an interim idea as well as a third concept of a megathalipsis of the Great Tribulation. Could you just close just detailing that? Just okay. So First of all, there is a third term, Perezmos, Perezmos, the hour of testing. Yeah. The hour of testing, which corresponds to um, what happens at that 
particular point at the end of the Megath Ellipse were kept from it. It must be the wrath of God because we're not appointed unto wrath. So the Perezmos has a correspondence to the uh, wrath, to the Orge. Yeah. Now, as far as your other, the other half of your question, the adjective, the Megath Ellipson, and the Lipson, Jesus said, you will have tribulation in the world. You'll have the lipsis in the world. The church at Smyrna, you'll have tribulation. Satan will put you in prison 10 days. Believers have always had the lipsis, have always had tribulation. But when the Antichrist comes to power, there will be something unique. Okay? Yeah. Something unique. One way to understand this is the history of the Jews. There was always pogroms. There was always anti-Semitism. The Jews were persecuted in medieval England, in York. The Jews were persecuted in France. The Jews were persecuted everywhere they were. But with the Holocaust of Hitler, something unique happened. It was like the mega pogrom, okay? Well, the tribulation is the same. There will always and has always been tribulation for the faithful church. But when the Antichrist comes to power, there's the mega philipso. That's the difference. Thank the you, adjective sets it apart from the others in terms of its severity and uniqueness. Nice and concise. Thank you. We're fast rushing, running out of time. If any, We're out of time. One, one final Quick question, then I've got one final quick question. Hi, hi Jacob, it's, it's Peter from Crossway in Bournemouth. Oh, hello, Peter. How's Sam? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah. Um, just a quick one then. Um, Matthew 24, 29, um, obviously you've said that Jesus appears immediately after the tribulation, so really, really linking in with that last question. Does that mean that the tribulation period finishes before the end of Daniel's 70th week? No, oh, yes, absolutely. It's during it. So the, so the tribulation is not just like the second half of Daniel's 70th week. It's a specific period within that, which then yes. say, for example, the day of the Lord or God's wrath makes up the end of the three and a half. That's period. correct. Yeah. Okay. Just clarify that. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Well, we have one out of time. The great tribulation ends after the sixth seal. Yeah, I, I, I understand that connection, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. May the Lord bless you. Now, if these numbers continue to grow, we're going to have a problem. As Amos pointed out, we had to expand our volumetric capacity with Zoom or whatever you call it. But we're probably, if it continues, going to have to go into uh, live streaming, live streaming. So please watch the Morio website or be alert uh, or Morio TV and RTN for future announcements. We don't know when we're going to do it, but it is not unlikely that at some point we may have to go into a live stream format instead of this. But right now, we are where we are. Amos? Thank you, Jacob. No, that's actually a really good bit of encouragement. If we have to do that, it does give us... It gives people more accessibility to the message and the preaching. But we do encourage you to join us again next Wednesday as well. I don't know what the Lord's laid on Jacob's heart as regards teaching, but we will be back again next Wednesday, same time. But please remember, I won't be sending out any personal invites any longer. The only invites will be coming out from RTN TV on the mailing list. So if you haven't subscribed and you want to take part next week, pop along to rtntv.org. Click the subscribe button, enter your details, and you'll automatically be updated and invited to the next program and any other events which RTN is running through Moriel and vice versa. So bless you all. Colin Higgs, are you still there? I Colin, am. I bless us and close us in prayer, Colin. Certainly. Father, we do thank you that we were able to come together in this way, Lord, when all around us is, is falling apart, Lord. And we do give you praise and give you your glory and thanks for the teaching that we've had tonight, Lord. For, for many of us, Lord, we, we're in a wilderness of our own. But we do thank you, Father, that we're able to come together as believers, Lord, 
and listen to the word being preached. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good stuff. Thank you, Jason. Bless you all. Take care until the next time. Thank you. Bless you too. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. God bless, bless you. Bye. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.